Hey YouTube, so in this video I want to talk about why the PlayStation Vita is failing and the topics I'll be talking about is hardware, software, game development, cost, and what I think the real problem is, and missed opportunities. So the first thing I want to talk about is graphics. People will say that the PlayStation Vita has console-like graphics. Theoretically speaking, every handheld has console-like graphics. So when you talk about the 3DS, it has N64 graphics. If you talk about mobile gaming, it would probably have HD-like Super Nintendo graphics. Then if you talk about PlayStation Vita, it has similar to PlayStation 3 graphics, but it's just below PlayStation 3. And then with PlayStation Portable, it's like PlayStation 2 graphics, but it's below PlayStation 2. It's in between PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. PlayStation Vita is in between PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3. And then 3DS is like N64, but it's above N64 graphics. So they can have more detail, but the overall aesthetics will be similar to N64. So this argument, in my opinion, is not valid because theoretically speaking, every handheld has console-like graphics. It just determines how close it is to the current generation of console graphics or even PC graphics. So the next point I want to talk about under hardware is raw specs versus focused hardware. Basically, down to a nutshell, this just means that having certain hardware choices to have a baseline standard of what can be achieved on that hardware or console or whatever. So, for example, maybe 1080p, 60 frames per second is something that should be standard on a certain console. So, therefore, hardware should reflect that. So maybe there's choices of hardware that they have, like maybe a, a lower CPU or the higher GPU to achieve the 1080p 60 frames per second. Maybe they added a lot more memory than usual because then that way they can do more things with it. Or maybe they have a good amount of physical media storage to add to what they want. So for example, with the Xbox and the PlayStation 2 era, the Xbox is a better console spec wise but the media format limits the xbox so th so therefore all the xbox could really do is just have smoother graphics and maybe a little bit added content but theoretically speaking that disc limits them so therefore no matter how big the playstation 2 game is it'll be the same size as the xbox game then going over to the playstation 3 xbox 360 the PlayStation 3 has 50 gig gigabytes of data on the Blu-ray disc, and then I think the Xbox sees uh, DVD or something, DVD format with about 8 gigabytes of memory, and then with the PlayStation 3, the Blu-ray had about like 50 gigabytes of memory. Even though the PlayStation 3 had a bigger physical media format to store the software, I think the hardware wasn't fully optimized to handle that much data at once so therefore it kind of had a drawback so this is where having certain aspects of hardware to associate to achieving certain goals so maybe having a large media format wasn't that good of an idea in a certain sense that the hardware wasn't able to manipulate that data fast enough as if it was a regular dvd but theoretically speaking, it did limit the Xbox 360 because they only had 8 gigabytes, I think, of, of memory on the disc and 50 gigabytes of memory on the Blu-ray. So therefore, they could do more with the Blu-ray. But it may have had longer load times. But the design of worlds did not have to be segregated or linear to accommodate the amount of discs that were on the Xbox 360. So going back to the handhelds, even though the Vita has raw specs, they, emph they emphasize raw specs, but what they should have done is emphasize focused hardware, meaning that what components are in the Vita that helps give with game development. So raw specs correlates to value and focused hardware correlates to game development or design. So this is basically the, the difference, and I think raw specs is just correlates the value. That's it. It doesn't really sell a console, 
but it determines the value of the market or the, it determines the state of the market. So think of it when the Vita was launched, the 3DS dropped in price because of specs and the 3DS had to drop in price because the raw specs of the 3DS wasn't, as, wasn't on par with the Vita. So therefore, it dropped in value. So therefore, raw specs correlates to value and then focus hardware will correlate to game design. So maybe 1080p, 60 frames per second Maybe not on a handheld, but maybe 720p with 30 frames per second would be the baseline to achieve on the platform. So the next topic I want to talk about is software. And the subtopics associated with this is games and apps. So I'll talk about games first. And I find many games associate a platform with how many AAA titles it has. And... This should not be a foundational basis of whether you should get the platform or buy the platform to buy the games associated with that platform. What gamers should do is associate good games with good game design. So therefore, like for example, the Order 1886, that has a big budget, or that had a big budget, and it failed miserably because of game design. Even though the game is fairly polished and there's not much of much bugs I have encountered with that game, despite that, it's design that will make a game fail. Even if you don't know design, think of it like Angry Video Game Nerd. He tends to pick games that have poor design. Even if you don't know game design, you will know when you hit a bad game. And this is different when, when you don't like a, a game, like your preference. Preference and game design are two different things. And with app support, I would say this is not really valid because the 3DS doesn't really have that much app, app support. And the app support for the 3DS is actually kind of lacking because of the specs that it has. When it comes to games, it should not be how many AAA titles are associated with a platform, but how many good games are associated with that platform, no matter how big or small that game is. And with the app support, the app support is a plus, but it's not a make or break uh, scenario. So the next topic is development. And the subtopics associated with this was how gamers perceive games, which is what I previously stated. So I'll skip that here, but I'll still emphasize that gamers look at budget than game design. And the other topic I'll talk about here is developers can't correlate hardware design to software design. So what I'm talking about here is the PlayStation Vita more specifically. So the PlayStation Vita had PS2-like graphics, and it had a single joystick on the left side, the same side that they have the directional pad. So therefore, the game should have been designed like how the PlayStation 1 games were designed, without analog sticks. And if on, this is on, kind of on Sony's part, because if you wanted to use the analog stick for movement or camera control, it should have been on the other side, meaning the side where they have the cross, square, triangle, and circle buttons on the right side. So therefore, the analog stick could have been used for camera control, and the directional pad could have been used for move character movement. And then the buttons would just be used for anything associated with the game. Now with the developers, they developed games on the PlayStation Portable as if it were a PlayStation 2 game, and they shouldn't have done that. And this is what I'm kind of talking about, how game developers don't really think too, too much about game design. So many of the games on the PlayStation Portable, if they were action-like games, they use the X or the cross, circle, triangle and square buttons for camera control which is a terrible design and then they use the directional pad for character movement terrible design so this is this is somewhat sony's part having the analog stick the one analog stick on the left side instead of the right side and then game developers not correlating to what they are working with so developers try to make hardware assimilate to software instead of software assimilating to hardware. So yeah, when that happens, you get somewhat bad game design. So 
So there would be like I think Siphon Filter was on the PlayStation Portable, and that was designed like a PlayStation Two game, and it should have been designed like a PlayStation One game, like the first Siphon Filter, not the sequels after it. Well, I think actually I think the sequels were on the PlayStation One, so any games designed on the PlayStation Two is a no. Any games designed on the PlayStation One, yes. So the next topic I want to talk about is cost and the subtopics associated with this is price points. So let's talk about the PlayStation Vita. But before I get into this, remember that for all specs associates to value. So going back to the PlayStation Vita, there are two models, a Wi-Fi only model and a 3G model with Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi only was 250 and the 3G model was 300. The Nintendo 3DS launched at 250 the iPhone 4s I think in 2011 there were contract and without contract so I'll talk about without contract first the 16 gigabyte model is 650 the 32 gigabyte model is 750 and the 64 gigabyte model is 850 now with now with contract the 16 gigabyte model is 200 the 32 gigabyte model is 300 and the 64 gigabyte model is 400 and this is fixed memory and then there's ipad pro and this is 2016 prices and there's wi-fi only with 32 gigabytes with 1050 and 128 gigabytes with 1250 and then there's also ipad mini this is 2016 prices wi-fi only models is 16 gigabytes at 330 32 gigabytes at 380 so when you look at those prices the devices that do less are, are priced higher and the devices that do a particular activity or concept better are priced a little bit lower while devices like the iPad and iPhone that do something else and do gaming second, they're priced a lot higher. But then people would say the PlayStation Vita and maybe the Nintendo 3DS was too expensive. The Nintendo 3DS was only expensive after the Vita was launched because that had raw specs better than the 3DS. So therefore the value of the 3DS plummeted. While the iPhone 4S, I don't think it's that strong. And same thing with the, the newer iPhones and the iPad Pros and all that. Their specs aren't that impressive, but yet they are priced at a higher range than anything else, especially when they don't do anything in particularly well, while devices that do those particular activities well are priced a, a lot lower. So this market, the mobile phone market, or... The market with devices that don't usually do everything or well, don't do anything in particular well and they do everything they tend to be at a higher price while things that are specialized in a certain concept or medium tend to be priced lower and then when that happens people tend to say say that it's too much and now I'll talk about accessories Accessories is another subtopic I wanted to talk about with cost. And I would say the only thing that is valid or somewhat valid or I agree with is the expandable storage because since it's proprietary, I think the reason why they did that was because of piracy. Like for example, the PlayStation 2 had a hard drive. It had to be IDE interface and then people use that to download games onto the driver, the hard drive. I think it was HD loader. Then they had a die shrink without the hard drive bay, so therefore it was harder to do. And then the PlayStation 3 had Linux, and they used that to hack into the system and what, or whatnot. And then Sony removed the Linux operating system or the capabilities of installing a Linux operating system. I would say Sony is generally for the gamer, but they tend to choose options that make it harder for hackers to manipulate their, their hardware 
in their favor. So that would be it for this topic. And the next topic is what I really think is the problem with the PlayStation Vita, and that is perspective or paradigm shifting. When I say paradigm shifting, I'm talking about how a person sees or processes information. And the subtopics for this section is why play a console-like game on a handheld, physical games are supported, expandable memory, having APIs to speed up simple processes and features, mobile phone gaming is a casual market, good game design sales, not budget limitations, and gamers expect state-of-the-art gaming to be cheap. The first subtopic is why play a console-like game on a handheld, this is going back to the graphics thing. So I just I won't repeat myself, but I'll just reiterate that every handheld has console-like graphics. It just determines how close it is to the current console generation. So the next point or topic is physical games are supported. Many people will talk about the iPad, the all these other devices that support gaming and also do other things, but they mainly are digital. They're only digital. And sometimes I'll see a YouTuber saying that I don't support digital content. And then in the background, they have like an iPad. And on iPad, they, they have games on iPads. And nothing you purchase on iPad or any kind of Apple device is uh, physical. Same thing with mobile market. Anything you buy on that, that sector of hardware or of portable hardware, it's all digital. And sometimes you'll see a YouTuber saying, I don't support digital content and then in the background or something or another video they will be playing with an iPad with games on it and be talking about games on that device so after support has dropped gamers can still play that particular device while on an iPad or any kind of Apple device if support has dropped for that generation then therefore no one can't play digital services available on that platform the next point I want to talk about is expandable memory the memory is expensive. It's getting better, but it is expensive. And the thing I want to emphasize here is not all portable devices has expandable memory. And this is competing with this is competing with the 3DS. And the reason why it's cheap it's not that cheap, or the reason why I say it's not that cheap, is because there's other alternatives on the market. So therefore, it it generates the value. And when that value of a particular market or sometimes category of hardware is cheaper with someone else or another device, then the value of a particular device is set. So if, for example, the PlayStation Vita's case, the memory cards or expandable memory is more expensive than the other devices with very similar memory. So therefore, the value of the memory is overpriced because you can have alternatives with the other devices unless they try to justify the high price point, which they haven't since it's virtually the same thing but different brands. And before I leave this topic, think about the Wii U and how it handles memory. So the Wii U has downloadable content and the built-in memory is 32 gigabytes. That's barely any enough for sometimes a handheld, while a console, a home console, has that kind of memory. So think about how a handheld has better memory for its category of hardware, while the Wii U tries to use very little memory to sell on a home console that has downloadable content. So the next topic I want to talk about is mobile gaming is a casual market. And what I mean by casual, I mean by game design and not player skill set. So on the mobile market, they have a lot of games that are quickly easy to get into and sometimes hard to master. And they tend to have no end game. So think of games like The Sims as casual. Anything similar to The Sims is a casual game. So maybe there's Tap Zoo or any kind of simulation game where they try to simulate farming, crap like that. Generally, that's a casual game. But not all casual games are never ending. There will be casual games where there is an ending and it will take a while to get to that ending. Or sometimes it's about high scores. So there are different categories of casual games, but overall, the market, the mobile market, is a casual market. So therefore, a lot of the games tend to be able to be played in short bursts or 
small periods at a time and still have progression. So think of it that way. And when it comes to dedicated handheld gaming, they can go beyond the casual market. So they can include the casual market on top of that, have more because it's dedicated to gaming. So basically, the 3DS and the Vita have an advantage over the mobile market since it's strictly only casual. And casual games can also appeal to or core gamers. So the next topic I want to talk about is good game design sales and not budget limitations. So when people talk about the PlayStation Vita and that it has high development costs, I would say that's a scapegoat because there are indie games available on the platform. So why not adjust your budget accordingly to the platform, especially if you don't really think it will sell that well? Test it out with a lower budget game. And another thing I want to talk about too is game developers make gamers used to fast releases. So Left 4 Dead is a perfect example of this. Left 4 Dead 1 was released in the same year as Left 4 Dead 2. And then another ideology in game development is World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft has been out for the longest time. I think in 2005 it was released and it's still being played today in 2016. So that's roughly like 10 years. So why is that still being played? Is because DLC is timely released. Same thing with Call of Duty. Call of Duty competes with its with itself. Call of Duty has surpassed Halo by a long shot. And now at this point, Call of Duty is competing with itself because they were launching the game too quickly and not taking it easy and releasing downloadable content periodically. So now with game development, they tend to release a game and on the day of they have DLC. And then so they have DLC released on the same day as the game is being released and then the main game is broken and they also have DLC on top of that. So why release a game that hasn't been tested and released yet? It's like the same ideology of or creating a computer program, compiling it and not actually running it and sending it off as a finished product. If you don't know if you don't understand that concept, in computer programming they have something called compiling. Compiling means that it associates all the computer programming language into ones and zeros so the computer can execute the program's logic. So therefore when you compile the program, it makes it an executable file, meaning that all the end user has to do is click on the file and the, and the program will run. So when you compile a program, you're, you're essentially debugging it at the same time creating an executable file. An executable file is a file that is able to run a program that has been translated to ones and zeros so the computer can use and manipulate and do whatever the program is meant to do. So what I'm trying to relate here is computer programming is very similar to when you try to debug a program but not actually following through with the debugging and a bug in the computer program is when something goes wrong like a glitch or something it can be for or against the player so my analogy is about having computer programmers compiling a program translating into ones and zeros without actually testing the program themselves and releasing it to the public and at the same time starting a new project while the previous project hasn't even been released yet. Usually speaking, once a project is done, you wait for it to be released. You don't start the next project while the other project is still being processed. That is backwards ideology. And the last thing I want to talk about is gamers expect state-of-the-art gaming to be cheap. So, right now I think the Oculus Rift was priced at $600. Theoretically speaking, that's fairly decent. I haven't really checked the market yet for virtual reality stuff, but generally speaking, a lot of the stuff that gets released early or a lot of the stuff that has state-of-the-art technology will not be cheap. And there'll be gamers that will say $600 is too cheap. You can probably buy some kind of Titan GPU for $1,000. There is a graphics card more expensive than the Oculus Rift 
think about that. There is a graphics card for a PC. From my understanding, I'm not a complete PC gamer, but I'm pretty sure there's a graphics card out there roughly around $1,000, more than the Oculus Rift. So think about that. So if you're going to build a gaming PC, the gaming PC is going to probably be worth more than the actual device that act that can generate virtual reality. So sometimes you have to put things into perspective. And I find that a lot of gamers tend to be fickle or they tend to be very cheap. They expect they expect a Ferrari to be priced at 15,000. That makes no sense. Sometimes things are overpriced. You might have like a Volkswagen pr priced at 60,000. And then Sometimes you have like a Viper priced at 20000 but generally speaking, if you want a Viper, it's going to be like 60000 to purchase versus getting a caravan at 20000 So the price point usually reflects the technology and tech inside the product. So therefore, if you want a Viper, you have to pay the premium price for that Viper. You can't pay a cheap price for a premium product. That is very rare to happen. And I find gamers don't understand this ideology. And they automatically think that something fails because it's priced too high. Again, look at the technology inside the product and whether the premium price justifies that product. Especially if there is something else in the market that can, be, that can draw comparisons to. So you can determine the value of the product. Sometimes when something is released first, they tend to overprice it because there's nothing on the market. And then when something else is released on the market, they bring down the price because something else on the market has better specs and with the premium price. This is this is what happened with the 3DS. 3DS was overpriced. So since nothing was at the market at the time of the release of the 3DS, it was acceptable. But once the PlayStation Vita was released, the value plummeted. That's how value fluctuates. It's solely on raw specs. So when people talk about raw specs, it's about the value of the product. Make sure that when you're paying premium price, it's a premium product. But don't expect a premium product to be at a cheap price. That is rare to happen. So the last topic I want to talk about is the missed opportunity. So the subtopics for this is PlayStation TV to unify all PlayStation handheld games. And secondly, advertise design, not specs. So with the PlayStation TV, because of the name PlayStation TV, people associate that with Xbox One's DVR features, or TV features, I should say. The Xbox One is able to manipulate the cable box's data, so the default input device for the Xbox One can manipulate that, or even use the, the Kinect to manipulate that data and scroll through the channels. But PlayStation TV is not that. PlayStation TV is basically PlayStation Vita on your TV. So it has nothing to do with TV shows and subscriptions to TV shows or streaming services. This is solely on... Well, there is streaming services, but it's all about games. This is solely about games and PlayStation Vita games and PSP games or PlayStation Portable. And the missed opportunity here is something similar. With the GameCube, there's like this device that you can attach underneath the console to play Game Boy games from various generations. I think from Game Boy Color, maybe even Advance, and earlier. So 3DS games are not playable. So this is what the PlayStation TV should have done. The PlayStation TV should have rejuvenate the PlayStation Portable physical copy games. So therefore, Sony's not losing out, and they'll be able to sell more products that way. So, And it would be a lot cheaper too, since you're just supporting the physical disc for the PlayStation Portable games, or the physical games. So that was a missed opportunity there. So they, can, they could have unified all the handheld games from the PlayStation brand to one device. And since there's only two devices, this is very simple to do. Well, I would assume so. So the last thing before moving on to the next topic, I would want to emphasize that game companies should take from Apple is that they tend to carry purchases over to the next product. So 
let's say for example the the first generation of iPhones and then the second generation of iPhones came out the second generation of iPhones is able to play or use any apps from the previous generation but the first generation is not is not able to use the newer apps because the apps are built for that hardware so then if there's a third generation of iPhones then the third generation is able to play anything and still use the apps previously while the new apps for the third generation won't be playable on the second generation and the first generation won't be able to play the second generation apps and the third generation apps so you should limit the product to the generation but the current generation should be able to have backwards compatibility with the previous generation's apps so therefore it's not as impactful when support is dropped you just keep the services running while transferring over the data to the next console or hardware in line and that's something that games or game developers or manufacturers don't do and i would say this is essential if digital content is going to be the standard if people are going to pay digital content then that should be able to be backwards compatible with previous hardware where they purchase digital content if they can't go back then people are less likely to purchase digital content so this is like the paradigm of gamers should be shifted to if you're going to be digital content only have backwards compatibility with previous generations of digital content and keep in mind if you're going to have backwards compatibility with dedicated gaming hardware understand the the different control inputs so if you added touch screen to one generation make sure the touch screen is always available otherwise the backwards compatibility is going to be pointless so with Nintendo they kind of screw themselves with certain aspects of this cuz how the controls of certain devices can screw up certain things so if you have touch screen now you should always support touch screen in order for previous purchases to be backwards compatible. This is like similar to what Apple is doing. Even though they have a new generation of phones, they always keep the screen touch screen. So therefore able to go back to the previous generation of apps so they can use that with the same input device. So keep that in mind if you're going to go backwards compatible with the previous generation, have the controller or input device very similar. If you add something new for a generation, you have to maintain that control or user input in order for it to be backwards compatible otherwise if you don't or remove that therefore you're going to probably hurt shoot yourself in the foot because you can't go backwards compatible since that input device has altered and then the last thing i want to talk about is that sony tends to advertise specs and not design and i think the reason why they probably do this because a lot of companies especially manufacturer companies and I don't even see developers even doing this. They don't know design as well as they appear to. With that said, they tend to emphasize specs. And what I said, stated previously throughout the video is specs or raw specs associates to value while focus hardware or the importance of having certain hardware inside the product should correlate to a baseline standard for the hardware. And that's what I mean by focused hardware. And they don't emphasize design. So when you have a product like, say, the PlayStation Vita, emphasize the types of designs that you can use on the PlayStation Vita. Don't emphasize the specs because not everyone knows design. So therefore, sometimes you have to spark people's imaginations and don't solely rely on someone's imagination to be sparked by raw specs. And that's basically it about this video. TX3 out.